In 2008, Nvidia released the GTX 280 for around $600, and while the card was a great GPU performance-wise, that came at a cost of a hefty price tag and a lot of heat issues, coupled with really high power draw. Therefore, many people ended up with a two times cheaper AMD competitor, the HT4870. Which although not really competitive with the 280, it didn't really need to be. With the aggressive pricing from AMD, the 4870 was pretty much everything you would need in 2008. Adding to that the fact that due to the smaller manufacturing process of 55 nanometers, AMD was able to create a dual GPU solution to take the crown of the fastest GPU on the market. While on the other side, a dual GPU would be impossible to pull off with the GTX 280 and all of its problems, but only until Nvidia came up with this. The GTX 285, possibly one of the most unique releases on the GPU market, as it is basically the second release of the flagship GTX 280, this time around the 55 nanometer process, and a hefty reduction in the release price, obviously meant to compete with the much cheaper and more appealing 4870. And of course, this time around, it allowed the creation of the dual GPU solution, which meant that Nvidia can now claim back the crown for the fastest GPU on the market. But today, our focus is on the fastest single GPU from the 200 series. So with all the refinement done to the architecture, what could you expect from the GTX 285 throughout the years? And if possibly, the card could even handle some of the lightweight esports titles of recent times. Let's fire up some games and check out if this card really is everything you need for DirectX 10 gaming across multiple years. Pretty much every game tested today is legendary in one way or another. So starting off with most probably the best in the series, the GTX 285 doesn't disappoint, offering excellent performance at pretty respectable settings. I certainly wouldn't complain back in 2012 if Far Cry 3 ran and looked like this. One thing worth noting about the card is the seemingly pretty high temperatures it will reach throughout the testing. But you shouldn't be worried, that's within the spec of the card. More importantly, the card stayed really quiet throughout the testing, even at the high loads. Despite being over a decade old at this point, the card is still older than CSGO, but regardless of all the updates that game received throughout the years, the GTX 285 can still perform quite well, even at 1080p, offering a 3-digit average, not bad at all in my opinion. In the pretty well optimized reboot for the Tomb Raider series from 2013, the card didn't have the slightest problems running the game at high settings at 1080p, almost 60 FPS on average. The frame rate might depend on the level you are currently at. From what I have seen, it won't really drop below a decent frame rate, regardless of the level. The first real issue for the card came while trying to run the notoriously unoptimized AC Black Flag. Well, it's either unoptimized or it really doesn't like running on old DirectX 10 GPUs. The GTX 285 was barely able to squeeze playable FPS even at quite reduced settings, and even then, the FPS dropped below 30 in a lot of instances. Seems like the game requires a lot more to be run at respectable settings and resolutions, and that the old DirectX 10 GPUs don't really cut it. My personal favorite in terms of first-person shooters is 2014's Wolfenstein The New Order, a real masterpiece when it comes to story and gameplay. Even the graphics aren't too bad for a relatively old title. Not to talk about the performance of the GTX 285. If only I had close to these results back in the day when the game was new, it would make the experience a lot better. Instead, I was playing on a GT220, barely scraping 30 FPS at the lowest settings. But somehow, I didn't complain and managed to finish the game without a problem. It's important to mention that the game is running on the OpenGL API as opposed to DirectX, which would be impossible as the card only supports version 10.1 and the game requires DirectX 11. It's nice to see the card doing this well with a not so conventional API. It's hard to imagine a DirectX 10 card benchmark without including the legendary GTA 5, and as you may expect it, it's a decent experience on this card. Obviously, not at the best visual quality, but after all, it's 1080p with decent averages. You don't need much more to enjoy the game. Yet another title that for some reason supports DirectX 10, long after many developers forgot about it. But with 2017 Southwest 2, the card works surprisingly well, at the Full HD resolution and as the game is mostly played in the dark, realistically, you don't really benefit from turning up the texture and visual quality. 
it's just nice to see the GTX 285 working great with what was most probably one of the last AAA-like releases to use DirectX 10 API. I didn't cover all of the DirectX 10 games at the benchmark list, but I believe that all of them can run relatively well on this GPU. As for the GTX 285 on itself, well, for the time it was around, the card could have served you well for DirectX 10 gaming. Nowadays, it's of course useless in so many ways, but in my opinion, for a retro gaming PC, the GTX 285 may be the way to go. That is of course, if you are prepared to have pretty high power consumption with this 200 watt beast. But on the other hand, it was the fastest card in the world at one point. It can be considered as worthy just to own one of these, especially in great working and aesthetic condition like this one. I hope you enjoyed this trip back in time when dual GPUs were still a thing, and most of the cards still had a nice shroud with a character on front of it. I will most probably be keeping this one as a piece of history. After all, it cost me just 10 bucks. Not a bad price for what once was the fastest card on the planet. Thank you very much for watching. Consider subscribing to not miss out on my future projects. And I hope to see you in my next video as well.